Have you ever played Where's Waldo? If you're one of the few people who missed out on this classic childhood experience, basically, there's this guy, Waldo, and he's got big brown frame glasses and a bright red and white striped shirt. And he's hidden in a room of hundreds of other people wearing hundreds of different colors. And the point of the game is to try to find him, see how fast you can find him in this room of people. And at first, the game sounds like really simple. I mean, he couldn't be that hard to find looking like that, right? But one of the craziest things about Where's Waldo is just how hard it can be to actually find him, no matter how hard you try. I mean, you just sit there for hours and hours and hours, and for some reason, you cannot focus on this one guy. An even crazier thing about Where's Waldo is how little e effort is actually required to complete it. You see, when you actually sit down and remove all distractions and you focus on trying to find this little dude, sometimes he'll jump right out at you. I remember when I was little, I used to play Where's Waldo all the time. They came in the little Wendy's boxes whenever we would go out to eat, and I would pick it up if we were on a road trip or if we were on the way home, and I would look for him and look for him and look for him, and I couldn't find him. And so I threw it down, I went in the house, and I went and did something else, and I picked it up again a couple days later. And my mind, fresh eyes, my mind was fresh, and I could just look at it, and I opened the book, and there he was, in like two seconds. Only when I took the time to pause and look at the situation with fresh eyes was I able to find him. How often do we see examples of this in our everyday lives, when we take a second in whatever we're doing, and we just pause and look at the situation with fresh eyes. For me, a lot of this can be in games, whether it's Where's Waldo or Fortnite or anything else. If I just take a second and put the controller down, I walk away, I go get some water, then all of a sudden I can play it and it'll be totally fine as if nothing happened. Maybe you see this in your life with school or with sports or even with driving. I know a lot of you are driving too. When you take that moment to just walk away and clear your head and come back, you can be fully immersed in the moment. So last week, we talked about how difficult it can be to really pause and be present in the moment. But once we do that, we talked about how we can improve the quality of our lives and our relationships with other people. Today, I want to take that a step further in our spiritual journey with the Lord and talk about how being present in this beautiful world around us will bring us closer to God's presence and how much easier it is to obtain his voice in the chaos of the world. We see a pretty good example of this, again, in Exodus as we've been studying. Instead of picking up where his story was, though, we're going to go back. We're going to go before the burning bush and the Ten Commandments all the way back to when Moses was first being introduced to God's plan for him. So at this time, we pick up where Moses is probably the furthest away from pausing that anyone could be. On the run, from the law, committing crimes. I mean, he wasn't like that, but <laughs> you get the point, right? Moses is on the run, and he's leading a flock of sheep for his father-in-law. And in this moment, we see God perform one of his most famous miracles in front of Moses to get his attention. So in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. So I don't know about you guys, but this sounds and probably looks really cool in the imagination, right? I mean, I grew up imagining the burning bush as like this great display of fire and heat and flames in like, a tension catcher that would instantly grab his eye. And it can be kind of difficult 
to watch examples of this happen in your everyday life and think to yourself, why isn't this happening to me? Why can't I find God's presence? In the churches that I went to as a kid, people were always shouting and, and running and dancing and, and even speaking in tongues around the church. And it was a great, great event whenever someone was saved. It was something that you knew would immediately catch your eye. And so I always thought growing up that if you were saved, you would instantly know. You can instantly know, but it would be unmistakable. You couldn't miss it, It'd be right in front of your face. And so this led to a lot of doubt whenever I became a teenager, around 13 and 14 years old as I wasn't experiencing those things. I played music, I was told I would find them there. I played games, I was told I could find them there. I went outside and I surrounded myself with some of the best people that I know that I'm still with today. But I still wasn't getting those signs. There was no burning bush. But as I was writing this, I took a second and I paused and I thought about what the burning bush really means. A bush isn't that big. <laughs> a bush is not something that would immediately catch your eye either, or mine. The burning bush was just another mundane thing in Moses' life before he heard God's voice through. I mean, he doesn't exclaim in surprise on seeing it on fire. He just thinks, wow, that's crazy. It's not burning. I wonder what that is. And he walks over towards it. It's not something that knocks him off his feet. And then I started to think about all the things in my life that if I paused and looked at with a second perspective, I could find Jesus there and it made a lot more sense. I find Jesus in music. I can't not hear his voice. I can't mistake it for anyone else but him. I hear him in music. I see him in games that espouse forgiveness and love and unity. I found him in all the wonderful people that I've come to know and love in all these years. And so what we see through Exodus and maybe through your own life is that God is capable and he can do amazing, spectacular displays of his power but he won't always get our attention that way. And we have to be careful to look for that. Even the story of Jesus shows us this, where instead of receiving a grand conqueror with crown on his head and flaming sword to go and retake Judea, we see a servant, a dutiful servant and teacher right in town on a donkey. What God has always been telling us from the very beginning is that he is right there. Seek him and you will find him. He is in front of our faces. But the distractions of this world can so easily cause us to mistake him for something else. We miss him time and time again. But I hope the beautiful thing that you can learn from this message and from these teachings is that everywhere we walk, every breath we take, everything we ever look at, contains evidence of God, contains God's presence. Everywhere we walk is holy ground, his holy ground that he created. We can find him everywhere. We need to pause though, in order to be able to see him there. We need to be able to pause, slow down, and take a couple steps back in order to see the bigger picture and find God in the little places.